This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. In the previous episode, Hideyoshi capitalized on the death of his lord, Nobunaga, to gain influence and seize his territory. Then, he went on to unify the rest of Japan and turned his attention to a greater project. The conquest of Ming China. We will cover the invasion of Korea in greater detail in another series. In this episode, we will focus mainly on Hideyoshi's motivation and later life. But before I get right into the episode, let's talk about our sponsor. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network service that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet. Surfshark VPN's clean web feature lets you block ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, allowing you to surf the web safely. Additionally, it doesn't monitor, track, or store what you do online. So that means no connection or activity logs. It also lets you swap the location of your device so that you can access exclusive contents only available from another country. You can even use it to access sites that are blocked from your current location. If you use the URL and promo code you see on screen, then you get 83% off with 3 extra months for free. With 30-day money-back guarantee, there is no risk in trying it out. You can also find the link and promo code in the description section below. The idea to conquer China originally belonged to Oda Nobunaga. It wasn't known how serious Nobunaga was because he only talked about it at a drinking party. Nevertheless, Hideyoshi had already stolen his boss's domain anyway, so he might as well steal his idea. The reason why Hideyoshi would do this is still a mystery. But there are a few possible reasons proposed by historians. It could even be a combination of these. First reason. Well, he might just be an unstable megalomaniac. Being a low-born nobody who managed to climb to the highest position in Japan, a kanpaku, his conquest to conquer China would seem like a modest step up in comparison. Besides, since he was not a member of the imperial family of Japan, he could not become the emperor of Japan. The only way for him to improve his station is to conquer China and became the emperor of a massive empire larger than Japan itself. It is also possible that he saw some similarity between himself and the first emperor of Ming dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang. The latter was a peasant rebel who overthrew the Mongol Yuan dynasty and became an emperor. Hideyoshi even boasted that he would lead the invasion himself, which he never did. The grief from the death of Hideyoshi's heir, Tsurumatsu, could also be the trigger for this late Middle Age crisis. In early 1592, Hideyoshi appointed his nephew, Toyotomi Hidetsuku, as his heir and kampaku, while he took the position of retired regent, Taiko, who still hold de facto power. Another theory is that after unifying Japan, Hideyoshi wanted to weaken the daimyos who might threaten him so he sent them overseas to get rid of their warriors to weaken them. Writers such as Samuel Hawley supported this theory. On the other hand, the daimyos might be interested in this idea too, because wealth during that era of Japan was measured in koku, the amount of rice a piece of land could produce. And since Japan had limited land area, their wealth was capped, so the expansion into the mainland had its appeals. The problem with this, however, was that the daimyos on the eastern side, such as Tokugawa Ieyasu, who had been transferred to Edo, was mostly spared from the cost of this war. And it will benefit him in the future battle of Sekigahara, when Japan will be divided into the eastern and western warring factions. A more modest theory proposed by historian Yamakishi Ryoji is that Hideyoshi just wanted to dominate the East and Southeast Asian trading region. He did not need to conquer and occupy all of China as long as he could defeat them and force them to sign a treaty to get access to Chinese products and trade, he could become extremely rich. The Ashikaga shogunate used to be part of the Chinese tributary system. That's the prerequisite for international trade with ancient China. But since Japan can't be seen as a tributary, they reinvented the shogun as the king of Japan. And the tribute was made through him instead of the emperor. It is all a charade, of course, and the bureaucrats from both sides pretty much just played along because there is just too much money to be earned. However, the Wako attacks on Joseon Korea and Ming China ended the trade. 
The Wakos were Japanese pirates who raided the coast of Joseon and Ming for hundreds of years. But by that period, only 30% were real Japanese and 70% were their followers. Some of the followers were even Portuguese, but the majority were commonly thought to be Chinese. One last theory I want to mention is Hideyoshi's worry about the growing influence of European power in the region. Spain, for example, had just colonized the neighboring island of Philippines, and 1565 was the start date of the Spanish colonization period. But Spain actually had greater ambition than this. In fact, Francisco de Sande, the governor of Spanish Philippines, wanted to conquer China too, and he had sent proposals to do so to King Philip II twice. He said that the people of China were generally unarmed and poor marksmen, and their arquebuses were worthless, so he thought he could have done it easily. Ultimately, his proposals were rejected. So rather than let Spain conquer China and let Japan fall in the domino, it might be rational for Hideyoshi to conquer China first. But is it even possible for him to win? Well, there was definitely a chance. At the time, the Japanese samurai and population were hardened warriors who had been fighting endless wars for over a century through the Sengoku period. They had also produced a massive amount of guns, more than any country in the world at the time. As for China, it was dealing with two confrontations simultaneously at the time, Bozhou Rebellion to the Southwest and the Ordos Campaign to the Northwest. So it's got its hands tied up. Not only that, the emperor at the time, Wan Li, had stopped going to court and abandoned his duties because of disagreements with his own ministers about his heir selection. But before Hideyoshi could get to China, he had to go through Korea, and this is where he would see trouble. Choson Korea ignored his request for passage into China, and that meant war. In April 1592, Hideyoshi launched his invasion to Korea. There will be a total of two invasions. The first one is called Imjin War in Korea and Bunroku War in Japan. The second invasion was called the Second War of Jongyu in Korea and Keicho no Eki in Japan. Both invasions are often grouped together as just Imjin War. For the Chinese, it is just a continuous Wanli Joseon War, named after the reigning emperor. In less than a month, the capital of Joseon, Hanseong, which is Seoul today, was taken. Due to a long period of peace, the Korean army just wasn't trained or prepared enough for the onslaught brought by the battle-hardened invaders and their guns. However, the Choson navy had powerful cannons and a lot of experience from combating the Wako pirates. With Admiral Yi Sun-shin commanding the navy, more Japanese ships were prevented from landing, and their supply line was virtually cut off. Facing various resistances, the Japanese army was bogged down and with the arrival of Chinese reinforcements, the invasion turned into a quagmire. For those of you who are interested in the details, don't worry, I will cover this war and the story of Admiral Yi in a future series. All you need to know for now is that the war just wasn't going well. In 1594, due to the stalemate, they started the negotiation process and most of them returned to Japan. Meanwhile, back home, Nobunaga's niece, who Hideyoshi groomed to be his concubine, unexpectedly gave birth to a son, Hideyori. This glad tidings delighted Hideyoshi. But not his nephew, Hidetsuku, who suddenly became redundant. Soon, rumors about him committing unjust murders started to spread mysteriously. And in 1595, Hidetsuku was accused of plotting a coup and he was ordered to commit seppuku. Hideyoshi then brutally executed around 30 of his nephew's family members and prevented retaliation. This act of brutality, in addition to the heavy loss from his invasion, started to alienate him from everyone, and he was pretty much seen as a complete tyrant. In 1594, the legendary thief Ishikawa Goemon was captured by Hideyoshi and executed by boiling. In some version of the legend, he tried to assassinate the tyrant Hideyoshi, but he was captured in the process. Goemon's name appeared historically, but his exploits were mostly legends that cannot be verified. Goemon is a popular legendary figure who stole from the rich to give to the poor, and he is often featured in popular media and video games. In one version of the story, he died in a pot of boiling oil while holding his son above his head. The Chinese envoys soon arrived to negotiate peace, but due to the language barrier and the lack of interpreter, they could only communicate through writing, 
And since Hideyoshi could not read much kanji, he didn't know what was discussed and was led to believe that he had won the war and the upper hand in the negotiation. Thus, he made seven outrageous demands, such as requesting the marriage of one of the Chinese emperor's daughters to the Japanese emperor. It would basically acknowledge that they are on equal standing to China, something China could never accept due to Ming Dynasty's tributary system. Since this kind of crazy demand was unlikely to be accepted, and the fighting men from both sides were eager to end the stupid war, Konishi Yukinaga, the Japanese commander, amended the demands and made it more modest. So he and the Chinese envoy forged a groveling letter of apology to send to the Chinese emperor. I think we can see how this complete farce will blow up in everyone's faces. Soon enough, in 1596, when the Chinese envoys came to Hideyoshi, they gave him the empty title of King of Japan without the trade privilege and the command that Hideyoshi must promise to never attack Korea again. The result was the complete opposite of what he had wanted. Due to all this bureaucratic bungling, obviously, war started again. This wasn't the only infuriating thing that happened to Hideyoshi that year actually, because in the same year, the San Felipe incident also happened. San Felipe was a Spanish ship that was shipwrecked on Shikoku, Japan while traveling from Manila to Acapulco. The local daimyo, Chosokape Motochika, tempted by the goods the ship was carrying, confiscated the cargo and told the crew to petition Hideyoshi himself if they wanted any recourse. Somewhere along the fiasco, one of the crew members mentioned that the Spanish modus operandi in conquering a new colony was to first convert the population to Christianity, then get the converted locals to do the fighting for them. Indeed, this method of divide and conquer was used to colonize the Philippines. Oh, that does it! The furious Hideyoshi had never liked those missionaries anyway, so he started to round up high-profile missionaries and Christians and crucified them in 1597. They would later be known as the 26 Martyrs of Japan. Additionally, churches were demolished and Jesuit missionaries were ordered to leave Japan. But this is not the end of the crackdown on Christians. The worst were yet to come. Hideyoshi, however, did not have much time remaining in this world. In 1598, as he lay sick in his recently built Fushimi castle, Hideyoshi made his last arrangements. He appointed a council of five elders to look after his young son, Hideyori. Among those in the council was Tokugawa Ieyasu, whose time to shine was about to come. Before he died, Hideyoshi composed a poem of parting. My life came like dew, disappears like dew. All of Naniwa is dream after dream. His death was kept secret as the Japanese soldiers were withdrawn from Korea to prevent loss of morale. Within a couple of years, the Battle of Sekigahara will be fought and Tokugawa will claim his place as the Shogun of Japan. On the next episode, we will look at the Battle of Sekigahara and the rise of Tokugawa Ieyasu. Make sure to subscribe and like the video so that you don't miss it. If you like what we are doing, then you can support us on Patreon or support our sponsor Surfshark VPN and use the link in the description. Until next time, stay cool my bros.